this this topic that I sent to uh, to Joe was uh, I was on uh, the other socialisms. It's kind of a, kind of a nice ring to it, I think. The other socialisms. And uh, well, the, uh, the the reason I sent it, this topic to Joe was that um, for years I taught a course that I I created a new course in the, at Loyola University where I used to teach called Capitalism and Its Critics. And it was, uh, it was my way of getting uh, some Austrian economics into the curriculum and because they, they wouldn't go for a course called Austrian economics, but, uh, but I, so I sort of did an end run around it. And, uh, and I got the idea from James Q. Wilson, the famous political scientist, uh, the late James Q. Wilson. He taught a course with the same title at Harvard Business School and then UCLA when he moved to UCLA. And uh, he sent me his syllabus, and it was real heavy duty. Like the, the first week of the class, you read The Wealth of Nations, and then the second week, you read uh, Das Kapital, all three volumes. <laughs> it was a Harvard Business School. But my course was not nearly that intense, but it was the same, same idea. And so I, had, so I had, you know, the beginning of it, I had all, uh, uh, Socialism by von Mises, you know, the calculation debate, and, and, uh, and I would have the good guys and the bad guys. I would have them read parts of Marx, and I put the whole Communist Manifesto in a syllabus, and then topic after topic, you know, as, as it went on. And so, uh, and so after, I, after I covered, uh, you know, the calculation debate and, and the great debates over socialism in the, in the 20th century, the early 20th century, and, uh, and the students, I thought, I had a good handle on that, I moved on to other types of, uh, of socialism. And uh, the first type, uh, you know, I looked at it chronologically, and I thought, well, fascism was was the next thing to come along. You know, once you get past, you know, uh, uh, Mises in the early days and the calculation, the early days of the calculation debate, then you had fascism to deal with. And, and Hayek, Hayek wrote a good bit on on, on that topic uh, for a long time. He uh, originally wrote an article in 1933 an essay called Nazi Socialism. And so, uh, and so I thought my, my students ought to know what, what fascism was. And uh, it was kind of funny because I would spend a couple of classes on this and I would give them all these readings and they just could not get it through their head that fascism was fascism as the, as the fascists described it because they had been taught that people like me were fascists. <laughs> and it just, just didn't compute. You know, it had been hammered into their brains that... That me, Ron Paul, Lou Rockwell, and you know, they're, they're fascists. You know, Macy's Institute. That's what a fascist is. And, just, and I, and I can still envision these these uh, the young students coming up to me after about three classes on this topic and having them read all this. Uh, you know, what is what is fascism anyway? They just, they just couldn't get through their heads. Anyway, uh, Hayek wrote this essay in 1933 called Nazi Socialism. And he said this. The socialist character of national socialism, Nazi national socialism, what Nazi meant, uh, has been quite generally unrecognized. German businessmen who supported the Nazi party were incredibly short-sighted for they did not recognize the pervasive anti-capitalism that was at the heart of national socialism. Okay, kind of reminds me of current American businessmen who think they can be in bed with the government and there will be no negative consequences ever in accepting subsidies and favors like that. And uh, Hayek he also no further noted that um, the Nazi policy platform, and part of my reading list uh, for this course was, you, and you can look it up on the web, uh, just Google uh, 25, I think it's the 1920 25-point program of the Nazi party. Okay, and you can find it on the web, you can find it on your phone. And I, that was part of the reading list. If you want to know what Nazism was about and what they claimed to be about and what fascist, their, that version of fascism, well, there you have it. It's right there. And so Hayek noted about this. He said there was, quote, full of ideas resembling those of the early socialists. The dominant feature was a fierce hatred of anything capitalistic, individual profit-seeking, large-scale enterprise, banks, joint stock companies, department stores, international finance, loan capital, you know, lending, you know, bank lending, and the system of what they called interest slavery. Those were all, those were all words from this 25-point program of the Nazi party. Okay. 
And he called it, uh, Hayek called uh, the Nazi policy program a, quote, violent anti-capitalistic attack. He's, and he goes on to say, it is not even denied uh, that many of the young men who today play a prominent part in the previous, had previously been communists or socialists. He wrote that in 1933, and Hayek did. Okay. And the common characteristic of all the German journalists at the time, he said, who supported the Nazis, quote, was their anti-liberal and anti-capitalist trend. Anti-liberal. You know, read, you know, get, get the book Liberalism. It's, it's for sale out here, and it's also online. Uh, liberal, you know, Mises' famous book, Liberalism, ex explaining what classical liberalism is. Uh, it's probably in need of a, new, of a rewrite today, and in in maybe in a booklet form. Uh, I, I, I actually proposed that to Regnery Publishing, a version of uh, liberalism, mod modern a day updated version of it, uh, written for the millennial generation to go along with my socialism book, but uh, they thought it was too academic sounding. They didn't. They didn't go for it. But I still think there's a real need for your generation. Uh, not Pear. He's he's over the hill. But I'm looking at the young uh, <laughs> the young students here uh, for to to learn about these things. You know, my students uh, at Loyola didn't I. Every year, I would ask. I would ask the class of, of uh, upper class economic students. Uh, at some point in your education, have you ever been asked to read the U.S. Constitution? And I'd always get zero, zero response. No, nobody even bothered. Let alone understanding the whole idea of limited government and so forth. Okay. Well, going getting back to Hayek in um, in uh, fascism. He goes on to say, all of the leading men of Italian and German fascism from Mussolini downward began as socialists and ended as fascists or Nazis. And of course, the, uh, the German socialists called themselves national socialists to distinguish themselves from the Russian socialists who were international socialists. But they're all socialists. They all called themselves socialists. Okay, so you know, how, you know, how the, Nazi, the Nazi became equated with capitalists is probably because of the, the, the economic system was they did allow private enterprise to exist, but it was controlled by the government. Uh, and uh, and they, they, they at least understood that they needed some kind of profit incentive to produce all those tanks and bombers and, and ammunition and, 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 uh, and all that, you know, armaments and so forth. Okay, to, uh, to go on to uh, Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini himself, he wrote a book called Fascism, Doctrine, and Institutions. And it was always kind of fun uh, walking around campus when I, I was doing research on fascism. I was thinking of writing a book on it, and uh, I was carrying around these books, all these books on fascism. And, uh, and so the, the other faculty at the university probably thought, well, well natu naturally, you know, there's De Lorenzo <laughs> walking around carrying books on, on fascism. He's probably thinking of using that next semester as his main textbook. And, uh, but, but in this book, he said, the fascist, this is Mussolini, no, no longer Hayek, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with the state. So you're only accepted as an individual if you agree with the state. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds today's uh, U.S. government. It is opposed to classical liberalism which denied the state in the name of the individual. So you know, he's right out there. They, they knew what classical liberalism was. Mises' book that's right around on the other side of this wall, Liberalism, um, uh, it was just a frontal attack by, uh, by Mussolini on those ideas in that book. They understood that they had to destroy those ideas first. And in terms of destructionism that I talked about yesterday, that, that was the, the key target of destructionism, the ideas of classical liberalism, according to Mussolini himself, uh, who wrote, by the way, he wrote uh, his autobiography, which I, I also read well, once, once upon a time. It sounds like the kind of assignment you might give to a third grader, you know, like, uh, okay, kids, we're going we're gonna to write, I know you're only eight or nine years old, but we're going to write an auto, a one-page autobiography, and you give it a name, you give it a title. And Mussolini's autobiography was titled "My Autobiography." I mean, that's, 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 something I thought when I saw that something like a, like a nine-year-old would write an assignment. Uh, you know, anyway, my autobiography. 
Uh, well, he, well, he went on to say, but he was, he was a pretty smart guy, and he was educated. And he said uh, that was probably because his, his uh, speechwriter was an American. Uh, the American ambassador to Italy was his speechwriter, and he was kind of a dunce, and I think and he, he ghost wrote the, uh, the autobiography. The max, he, uh, Mussolini said the maxim that society exists only for the well-being and freedom of the individuals composing it does not seem to be in conformity with nature's plans, which care only for the species and seem ready to sacrifice the individual. So he's thinking of these animals like, uh, you know, what, what kind of animal can you think of that they mate and then they die a minute later, like, you know, bees or you know, some kind of bees that you see on the, on the Discovery Channel, especially in Africa, something like that. He's thinking that's, that's, what, it, that's what humans should, should be like. And he decried the, the classical liberal ideas to be dead. And he said, if the 19th century was the century of the individual, and then in parentheses, he wrote, liberalism implies individualism. We are free to believe that this is the collective century. It's certainly true about that, 20th century. And therefore, the century of the state. If classical liberalism means, spells individualism, fascism spells government. And that should all sound kind of familiar to you, shouldn't it? Okay. And so that's, uh, that's Mussolini. And he, he, he went on to bemoan the selfish pursuit of material prosperity. Fascism is a reaction against what he called the flaccid materialistic conception of happiness and said, uh, reject the economistic literature of the 18th century. And I, I presumably he was referring to Adam Smith. Now, as far as individualism goes, um, you should remember that like, in, in the first chapter of The Road to Serfdom, Hayek uh, addresses this. There's a whole chapter on individualism. I mean, he says, all it is, all it means, all it ever meant was respect for the individual as a human being. That's all. It doesn't mean uh, you advocate uh, people living alone as individuals uh, in an atomistic society and not cooperating with anybody else. It simply means uh, uh, human respect for, for other human beings as, uh, as fellow human beings. End of story. That's what Hayek says in the first chapter. And so all of these socialists have reject this because uh, there are some human beings who don't deserve respect aren't there, according to the fascists and the, and the communists. Uh, you know, we need to manipulate them. Okay. And uh, I, when I was, uh, years ago, when I got into all this fascist literature and I, I read all these books, I was thinking of writing a book on it, and I, I never got around to writing the book on it, but I did uh, write a Wall Street Journal article. It was when, uh, when the Clinton health plan was being debated years ago, when before Obamacare, there was a, a push to create something called Hillary Care. When, when Clinton became president. And all during the campaign, they kept talking health care, health care, health care, health care, but they had no details whatsoever of, the, of what they wanted to do with health care. And then after he was in, Clinton gave his first State of the Union speech where he laid it out. He said, this is what we're going to do. And he said, well, there are going to be seven political appointees that are going to be in charge of different aspects of the medical care system. You know, there's one will be in charge of medical schools, then the nursing schools, and the medical technology czar, and seven political appointees. And then we're going we're gonna to create these uh, sort of uh, in industry level uh, organizations, government organizations that will run med the medical schools, and will run the nursing schools, and will run you know, new government bureaucracies. And when I, when I sat there listening to Clinton's speech, uh, it sounded familiar. Where did this, where did I, I heard this before? And where I heard it before was it was uh, almost identical to, uh, to the, uh, the, the way in which Mussolini organized Italian industry into cooperatives. And there was an insurance cooperative, a steel industry cooperative, you know, you know, you know on and on and on. So I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal. They gave it the title, Clinton Health Plan Salutes Italy's Past. And I and I and I quoted I quoted all these fascist authors like the ones I just some of them that I just mentioned, of explaining what a great idea this would be to organize medical care this way. And then in the last paragraph, I revealed who I was quoting. I didn't I didn't say who they were. It's just some Italian guy, you know, on, on, the, on the top. And it was you know all of Mussolini's uh, buddies that, that were saying this. And and um, Clinton got Franco Modigliani 
the uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist to try to out Italian me in the, in the letters column. He wrote a letter to the editor and he said, Bill Clinton will not make the same mistake that Mussolini did. Mussolini's mistake is he delegated too much power. Bill Clinton is not going to make that mistake. And so, and so all of our friends ganged on. The journal at the time, was, the editorial page, I think, was run by John Fund, and the, who had worked at the Cato Institute. So he, he published a, a barrage of letters uh, 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 ridiculing and making fun of Medigliani for, for, for saying these things. And, uh, so, and that, was, that was a lot of fun. So all this reading of all these books on fascism kind of paid off. And I had a little fun with, uh, with, with the Wall Street Journal, as far as that goes. Okay, now, German, the German National Socialism, there, there's a book called Three Years of World Revolution by uh, a German author, Paul Lynch, about German fascism. It says pretty much the same things that, uh, uh, similar to Mussolini did, is, is uh, uh, he condemns the English liberalism. He used the word English liberalism is a classical embodiment which was adopted by the spokesman of the German bourgeoisie in the 50s, 60s, and 70s of the 19th century. So he's saying that liberalism, the you know, Misesian liberalism, <clears throat> was alive and well in Germany in the, in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, and that was a bad thing. He was saying so German libertarianism, German liberalism was a bad thing. It must be destroyed, uh, says uh, Paul Lynch. Uh, he says, these standards are old-fashioned. Freedom, freedom is old-fashioned. You know, you know, freedom, schmiedem. You know, what has to be done now is to get rid of these inherited political ideas and to assist in the growth of a new conception of state and society. In this sphere also, socialism must present a conscious and determined opposition to individualism. Okay, and then of course the the, uh, the Nazi uh, program, as I mentioned, the twenty five point program. I already mentioned some of the things in that, and one of my favorite quotes from Hitler himself uh, in Mein Kampf, he says, "The Aryan is not greatest in his mental qualities as such." He's pretty much saying, you know, our people are kind of dumb, uh, you know, they're not not the greatest in mental qualities. But what they're really great at, he said, is in the extent of his willingness to put his, all his abilities in the service of the community. He willingly subordinates his own ego to the community and, if the hour demands, even sacrifices it. You know, he's willing to die for the community, but even, even though he's kind of dumb. I guess you'd have to be kind of dumb, right, to, to, to sacrifice for the, for the community. So he was right about that. And... And so I'll leave it there as far as the uh, the, the Nazi uh, program. I mentioned I mentioned that if you if you were to look it up, you'll find that much of it is very similar to the Roosevelt's New Deal as uh, as far as that's concerned. And so, uh, you know, as far as other socialisms are concerned, fascism is another socialism. All the, all the the uh, 20th century fascists started out, including Mussolini, as socialists. They always called themselves socialists, National Socialism. And it's just a slight variation, in my view, of uh, uh, socialism. And, and I recommend Lou Rockwell's book on fascism and capitalism. I, mean, I assume it's for sale, isn't it, Lou, at, uh, at the Mises Institute here, uh, and uh, among others. And the next thing I, I would I had my students look at, you know, the, you know, we went through the great calculation debates and, and, and all that, and then uh, I had them study fascism a little bit, uh, then cultural Marxism. I had, uh, I had him read some of the literature of cultural Marxism, and among among the uh, authors there are the, the famous Antonio Gramsci, uh, Lukacs, which is spelled L-U-K-A-C-S, Herbert Marcuse, uh, Adorno, uh, Horkheimer, Brecht. These are all names of the so-called cultural Marxists, and these were academics. These were Marxists in Europe who were uh, disappointed and upset that uh, the Marxist revolutions didn't really catch on. The working class didn't really want to take control of the factories and run them. All they wanted was better wages and working conditions. They didn't want to, they didn't want to destroy society and, uh, and, and, and have some sort of utopian uh, world. And so they were, they were uh, uh, upset about that. So they started their own institute that was originally called the Institute for Marxism, but I suspect um, their PR person told them, 
better cool it with the Marxism because the world knows now that Stalin has killed many millions of people in, in the name of Marxism, and maybe you don't want to be associated with that. So they, they re changed the name to the Institute for Social Research. And this is the Frankfurt School. It's the famous Frankfurt School, as it was known. And basically, it's some, of the, some of the key ideas uh, are, uh, you know, um, Gromsky himself, the, the Italian, he was known for this, uh, this you know, the long march through the institutions, advocating no, no violent revolution, take over all the institutions of society, which they pretty much have uh, in, uh, today. And so, so these, you must essentially destroy these existing institutions and then run them yourselves in a different way, including the universities, the media, publishing, movies, religion, family, national sovereignty. These are all targets of the, the early cultural Marxists who came about, we're talking the 1940s when they became prominent, they came to the United States. Some of them fled Nazi Germany and ended up uh, getting prestigious positions at Columbia and, and, and schools, and, you know, Ivy League schools. And, you know, and many of them eventually moved, they moved to Santa Barbara, California in the 50s and you can imagine how beautiful Santa Barbara must have been in the 50s before all the population and the pollution and everything. And, and, and they, they were just miserable people who hated everything about American society. They're living in Santa Barbara. They have well-paying academic jobs. They can write whatever they want to write. They get publishing contracts. They're, they're getting invited to give speeches at the Ivy League schools all the time. And they just hate life. They just every, Everything they wrote was... They hate consumerism. They hate Americans. They hate they just everything. Uh, you know, criticize, 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 and that's why they created critical theory. You know, that's what critical theory is, and critical theory is why you have all these uh, university majors with the word studies in them. You know, if a major has the word studies, you know it's a bunch of BS, <laughs> socialist BS. You know, I, I, some of you. I told my class that, and some young lady in the back said, "Well, oh, my study, my major has the word studies in it." And uh, I didn't—I don't know if uh, <laughs> it, was, it was maybe it opened opened her eyes a little bit to what she was taking uh, out there. But that's what this comes from. And there was a uh, a, a left-wing uh, lawyer. You know, I taught in a business school it was run by Jesuits, so they they hired uh, ten or twelve left-wing lawyers. To, to make sure that the, the uh, students didn't learn too much about markets and capitalism. And, and, uh, and this one, she, she created a new course on, called Critical Theory. And this was probably 20 years ago. And I asked her, uh, well, what, what's the intellectual background? Is it philosophy? Uh, you know, what, is, what is sociology? And she just said, no, we just criticize people like you. And, uh, and, which is true. And so over the years, she produced all these students and all they knew how to do was complain. They would, they would, you know, the other professors, not just me, but the other professors, they would talk about these kids and they, they'd just complain about everything. And they, they didn't know how to structure an argument. They couldn't debate. They didn't, they didn't know how to debate intelligently. And, or they, they, they had real trouble following the logic of economic theory. But they complained about everything and they thought they were educated because they complained about it. That's, that's what the critical theory, at least at that institution, turned out to be. It's probably probably a little more highbrow at other institutions, but this woman's class apparently didn't, wasn't very, uh, very rigorous. Okay, so they, and, and so they decided they needed a new class theory. The old Marxian class theory didn't work out too well. It didn't, uh, the working class didn't want to violent revolutions in, in Europe. And so the Marxian class theory of the conflict between the working class and the capitalist class had to be replaced. So they, they, the new theory basically is uh, the oppressor class versus the oppressed. And the oppressor class is basically white heterosexual males, and the oppressed is everybody else. Uh, that's, that's the way I see it. It's, and I'm not the only one that sees it that way. If you just look around the world and read what they say, that's pretty much what, what the new, new, new uh, class warfare is. And their thinking, their thinking was, well, the working class is not enough. It's not enough votes to, uh, or not enough people to get our socialist revolution. We need more than just the, the people in the factories. And so and if, you, if you break it down this way, the oppressors and the oppressed, well, then we, we can convince all women that they're oppressed. All minorities are oppressed. All, everybody, every group that you can 
categorize people into you're being oppressed by the, the white supremacists, as, as, as they tell us all day long, every day now in the United States, you know, day in and day out, if you disagree with them. As I said in my talk yesterday, I, I was reading the news in the morning before I left, and there's a, a, a Whoopi Goldberg, this hideously hideous woman on TV, <laughs> calling, calling uh, 500 young conservative students at their conference uh, in, in D.C., Nazis. You know, there's name calling, <laughs> Nazis, you know. They have armbands, they have swastika armbands down there as they listen to, uh, to all the speakers at the, to this Turning Point USA conference. Okay, so they invented a new class, new class theory and they and invented critical theory, which has, you know, swept the universities and uh, uh, and they also wanted to, do, part of their theory was uh, one of the reasons why, among the reasons why they had trouble with Marxist revolutions in Europe was that people were too attached to Christianity, too attached to Western civilization, which is a, a broad topic, and too attached to family, the, the nuclear family. And so that's, that, in my opinion, is why you see... Uh, the, uh, the founders of Black Lives Matter, who call, who pro call themselves trained Marxists, is right in their literature on their website, say uh, we, destroying the nuclear family is one of their objectives. That's what they want to do. And so you, you see that sort of thing, the attacks on religion. And so th they understood that, you know, if people are too attached to religion and see God as their savior, well, then uh, government cannot be their savior. You, know, you don't have one savior. You, know, you, have a, you don't want a competing savior. You need us to be your savior. And so hence the attacks on religion, especially Christianity. Okay, Western civilization. You know, it's everything we see in, the, in today's world is an attack on some aspect of Western civilization. Uh, when they had the riots in the U.S. Uh, you know, two years ago, uh, I was still working in Baltimore, and one of the very first statues they pulled down was the one of Christopher Columbus in the, in the, the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. They threw it in the water, in, in the Columbus statue. It's in Little, the Little Italy section of, uh, of Baltimore. And they've, you know, they've torn down the Jefferson statue, the Lincoln statue. Hold your applause. Hold your applause <laughs> uh, on that one. <laughs> they've even gone after him. Um, because he didn't treat the Indians very well. That's, that's what I've read anyway, that he, he executed 38 Sioux Indians after it, and, and they up, there was a Sioux uprising because the U.S. government once again shafted the Indians. They took 400 acres of their land that didn't pay for it, and the Indians didn't like that, and so they waged war, and, uh, and, uh, and they hanged 38 of them, and, and apparently the lefties got wind of that, and so now they're tearing down Lincoln statues. Uh, for that, so they and they wanted to, the, a part of the um, argument also is to destroy traditional sexual morals because that would be a way of destroying Christianity, and so that that's uh, a lot of what you see today in that regard, as, as was written in the 1940s as sort of the game plan uh, to go about this, and free speech must be destroyed, and this is a result of Herbert Marcuse's. Uh, a now famous essay called Repressive Tolerance, where he argued that free, free speech is a tool of the oppressor class to keep down the oppressed, and therefore only the oppressed deserve to have free speech. So if someone like myself or Tom Woods, uh, let's say, shows up on a college campus and there's a riot and they set the buildings on fire and things like that and chase us out of town, uh, and, uh, which happened to Charles Murray uh, at, at, uh, uh, at the school in Vermont, Middlebury College in Vermont. I don't know if you remember this. A couple of years ago, Charles Murray, his daughter graduated from Middlebury College, and so the, a political science professor invited him to give a talk on his latest book on labor markets. And Murray is a PhD political scientist from MIT, and, and so he, he's a very big name in political science. And so uh, and there, there was a riot, a student riot. As soon as he stood up, they started screaming at him. And some, some young punk grabbed the female professor's hair, the female professor who invited him. He grabbed her hair and jerked it so hard that he injured her neck and she had to be taken out in an ambulance. And then they left town in a car and they were chased by cars out of, out of town. 
And so these students were, were convinced they were taking the moral high road in doing this because Charles Murray was a representative of the oppressor class and the oppressor class does not deserve free speech. Only the oppressed deserves free, free speech. The, the oppressed as defined by the socialist ideologues who run the universities, that is. You know, not people who are genuinely oppressed. You know, like the children of Tiger Woods who just became a billionaire. I'm a golfer, so I love Tiger Woods. You know, I doubt that his son is oppressed, even though he's a minority. You know, as far as that goes, but 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 he is according to the definition of the, uh, you know, the people who run universities like Middlebury College. Okay, so destroy free speech. And I first ran across this maybe 15 years ago. One of my students was was explaining to me. Uh, why uh, this this theory that had been drilled apparently drilled into his head since preschool, and uh, it was sort of an eye opener to me that all of a sudden the students in my classroom, they knew nothing about the arguments about free speech. They never heard you know, John Stuart Mill, who's that? They never heard of the arguments for free speech, but they knew they understood the argument against free speech. And I asked one of them when he first time I asked him, well. If I walked into downtown Baltimore and some black guy calls me a honky, does that harm the entire white race? And, uh, and because that's what they were saying. And, and so and nobody's advocating racial slurs or anything like that. But they were what they're talking about is, well, uh, like when Walter Block came to my campus and gave an invited talk, invited by me, and gave a sort of state-of-the-art talk on economics of discrimination and about how if I, you know, if I'm a discriminating employer and say I, I pay men more than women, then uh, because I'm a misogynist, then I, I create a profit opportunity for my competitors, who can, uh, you know, if I pay the man a hundred grand and the woman fifty grand, uh, my competitor can pay the woman seventy grand, and if she's equally productive as the man and can produce can produce more than a hundred thousand a year for me in revenue. Well, he probably makes he makes a lot of money. He makes thirty thousand dollars or so. So there's a profit incentive, and all Walter did was explain how competition in the marketplace uh, reduces discrimination, it penalizes sex discrimination, race discrimination. And his his dissertation chairman at uh, Columbia, Gary Becker, was known for that. He won the Nobel Prize, and they, they cited his work on such things as the economics of discrimination. He wrote the first book. On that, it was his doctoral dissertation at Chicago in the fifties, and, uh, and so and so the and so the 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 communists, uh, well, Jesuits, communists, what's the difference? Who <laughs> who, who ran who ran Loyola uh, smeared and libeled Walter o over that, and so so it's, so so this attacks on free speech that are said to harm minorities. It's not about the, the dingbats who make racial slurs and things like that. It's this sort of thing. It's this sort of thing of you know, making a case for capitalism and, and, and challenging the, uh, the sacred idea that black people cannot make it in America because racism is so bad. No matter what you do, you, you're, you're doomed. That's what they want to teach the, the young black students and my former employer. And here comes Walter Block saying, well, no, not necessarily. You know, you know, you know, you can work your way out of despite all of this, and, and there are thousands and thousands of examples. They don't tolerate that. They smeared and libeled Walter and me, since I invited him, for for doing that. But we did sort of uh, get back at them in a way. We wrote about twenty articles on LouRockwell.com, and Walter and I spent probably a total of fifteen hours on WBAL radio in uh, in. Uh, in, in Baltimore, the biggest radio station in the area up there, lambasting these people, it made me really popular with my employer at the time. <laughs> but I had no, I had no choice; I had to do it. Okay, so that's that's another part of uh, this uh, name calling that became a part of it. Also, uh, Marcuse also wrote a book called Eros and Civilization, and the advice he gave college students, which probably popular advice today as it was in the 1960s. He said, don't work, have sex. That was a famous slogan. I think it's t-shirts with that. That's good advice for a young person. It's, yeah, yeah, that works, work. Okay, the, now the third, the third thing I'll, I'll mention, another type of socialism is uh, what I call watermelonism. 
the watermelons, you know, green on the outside, red on the inside. And so I had my students read, uh, I had them read uh, some of the founding fathers of environmentalism, like Barry Commoner. I don't know if anybody here has heard of Barry Commoner, but <clears throat> he was one of the real high priests of environmentalism in the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, what I'm going to do in the time I have left is there's a, a publication by the Competitive Enterprise Institute called uh, Wrong Again, 50 Years of Failed e eco Apocalyptic Predictions. It's published by the CEI a couple years ago. And it's a collection of actual articles, Time Magazine, New York Times, reprints. It's not, a, it's not an essay. It's just a collection of reprints of articles on environmental issues beginning in the 70s. And they have a common theme. Here's the one of the first ones in their collection is... Uh, <clears throat> The forecast, so this is uh, 1967, dire famine forecast by 1975. And they, they quote Paul Ehrlich, who was a, a bug scientist, an entomologist at Stanford. But somehow they call him a population biologist. But he's, his, his job at Stanford was an, he was an entomologist. They study bugs. Okay, but anyway, and he became quite the celebrity he said this, the population of the United States is already too big. Birth control may have to be accompanied by making it involuntary and by putting sterilizing agents into staple foods and drinking water and that the Roman Catholic Church should be pressured into going along with routine measures of population control. Sounds like Bill Gates could have written that <laughs> today. But that was Paul Ehrlich in 1967. And so, and he was one of the founding fathers of the modern environmentalist movement. And by the way, I distinguish between a conservationist and an environmentalist. Conservationist is somebody who's genuinely interested in conserving wildlife and nature and so forth. An environmentalist is a communist ideologue uh, hiding behind the, uh, the guise of uh, Mother Earth. That's, that's my sort of crude definition of environmental. That's, that's the way it has turned out. So you don't have to... You know, if you're a conservationist, you, know, you don't have to call yourself an environmentalist and, and associate yourself with Paul Ehrlich. You know, you could associate yourself with uh, a much better uh, you know, type of person. So that was one of the opening salvos. And this, and Ehrlich was funded by something called the Club of Rome, which is sort of linked in with the, the, the World Economic Forum and, and this crowd today. They're sort of, the, sort of all the same gang <clears throat> run by uh, billionaires. April 16, 1970, headline, Boston Globe, Scientist Predicts a New Ice Age by the 21st Century. October 6, 1970, Dr. Ehrlich, outspoken ecologist, to speak, the oceans will be dead in 10 years. He said, and this is 1970, so by 1980, there'll be no fish in the ocean, Paul Ehrlich was saying. Back in those days, they were saying pollution was blocking the sun, and it was therefore going to cause a massive cool down of the earth in a new ice age. Okay. And we've made tremendous progress spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year, year in and year out, in pollution control. And so, and now that we don't have hardly any dirt up there blocking the sun, it's, it's even worse because we've got global warming now. And so we, we succeeded in getting rid of the problem that they cited in the, in the 60s and 70s, and, and, but there's still a problem. And of course, the, the answer to all of this is always we need to get rid of the existing economic system and adopt socialism. I quoted uh, Robert Heilbrunner yesterday in his uh, famous, among some of us, article, After Communism, The New Yorker magazine in 1990, uh, where he said, uh, socialism must be adopted to deal with the ecological crisis. And that has been their, their motto. NASA scientists... In the next 50 years, fine dust man constantly puts in the atmosphere, could screen out so much sunlight that the average temperature could drop by six degrees. So, so a new ice age is coming. And this went on for a long time. Here's a January 29th, 1974 article. Space satellites show new ice age coming fast. This is 1974, because so it's just around the corner. Time Magazine, June 24th, 1974. Another ice age question mark. It says this, telltale signs are everywhere. 
from the unexpected persistence and thickness of pack ice in the waters around Iceland. Think about that, there's ice in Iceland. Could you imagine? <laughs> to the southward migration, migration of armadillos from the Midwest. So, so you, you see an armadillo in South Carolina, that's proof positive that the, another ice age is coming. There, the Time magazine was, was saying. Okay. Washington Post, great perils to life. Just ahead. So turning page here. In 1990, as late as 1990, Associated Press headline, no end in sight to the 30 year cooling trend. Okay, and that's 1990. Well, all during this time, like I said, the environmentalists were saying the solution to, all, to if you want to avoid a new ice age and we all freeze to death, we need to destroy the economic system that's creating all this pollution and adopt socialism. Okay, then that didn't work. They didn't succeed. They got to all the way to 1990 with no success. They began in the mid 1960s. Okay, so 25 years of this propaganda didn't work. So they had to try something else. So here's a Miami, uh, Miami, Florida newspaper, June 24th, 1988. 1988 is on the way to be the hottest ever as world temperatures are up sharply. So they 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 moved on. They they rotated on a dime, as the saying goes. December 12th, 1988, uh, the Today Show, prepare for long, hot summers, okay? September 26th, 1988 article. There's a threat to the Maldives because of global warming melting the ice. The sea level is threatening to completely cover this Indian Ocean nation of 1,196 small islands in the next 30 years. Salon Magazine, 1989, New York City's West Side Highway will be underwater by 2019. Any New Yorkers here? Have you, have you swum across the West Side Highway uh, lately? Or, or, you know, taken a kayak? Oh, you probably take a boat. You'd have to take a boat. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to swim there. It's too cold. Yeah. There's an article, uh, March 20th, 2000, Associated Press articles. Snowfalls are now just a thing of the past. Associated Press is The Guardian. This is a 2004 U.S. edition. Britain will be like Siberia in 20 years. Okay. 2008, Al Gore predicted the North Polar ice cap will be gone. No ice in the North Pole by the year 2013. <laughs> Al Gore. There's a, there's a picture of him there. He's, he's still fat and ugly as ever, isn't he? <laughs> I saw him on TV the other day. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the renowned uh, uh, astrophysicist and climatologist, Prince Charles, in uh, 2009, said there are just 96 months to save the world. So that, that, that would bring it to the year 2017. The world was going to end, according to Prince Charles. And then the former Prime Minister of England, Gordon Brown, on uh, October 20th, 2009, said, quote, we have fewer than 50 days to save our planet from catastrophe. I guess that's where uh, this woman, AOC, got her 12 years. You know, Gordon Brown thought 50 days in the, in the world is going to end. And so, and, and so once again, of course, they, they, you know, it's global warming. To avoid global warming, we need to destroy the existing economic system and adopt some form of socialism and central planning. And of course, at that point, by, by the end of all these articles I've been reading from, uh, it had changed again to climate change. So now it's climate change. So whether if the climate gets hotter or colder, it doesn't matter. The solution is always uh, we've got to destroy capitalism and adopt socialism. And so that's, that's uh, what I wanted to say in the time I have about watermelonism as a form of socialism. And uh, I guess we're out of time and the, the dictator will no longer let me ask to have Q&A. So class dismissed. <laughs>